You don't need a costume to be a person. You just need you just need to be yourself. Yeah, so I threw that outfit out and I became who I am today. <laughs> a pizza man. <laughs> What's up, everybody? I'm your host, Chris Hampton. Welcome to the Power Company Podcast, brought to you by PowerCompanyClimbing.com. Today is a rewind back to an episode that first aired on Christmas Eve of 2016, and then aired again on the Enormacast in January of 2017. And we chose this episode to air today because 40 years ago, Miguel Ventura moved from Connecticut to Slade, Kentucky and started what was then known as the Rainbow Door. And while the namesake Rainbow Door is still there, the name changed in 1986 to Miguel's Pizza. If you're a climber and you haven't been, you probably want to go, or you've at least seen a dozen people wearing their t-shirts. I learned to climb in the Red River Gorge, and when I started, Miguel's was a tiny one-room pizza place and ice cream shop with a couple of tables and enough parking spots for four or five cars. I've known Miguel literally for as long as I've been a climber, and I'm grateful that he agreed, not without a lot of convincing, mind you, to have this conversation back in 2016. I actually first ambushed him at a dinner party at Dario's house right after interviewing Russ Clune. I put him on the spot and he said yes because he was in front of all these people and then I just pestered him until he finally relented. And I also chat with Dario in this episode whom I've known since he was a little kid getting dragged to the crags about the changes that he's seen take place there. There's also a part in here where Miguel talks about a drawing he made that has stuck with me since the day he told me the story. Listen for it. All right. Let's get into it. I think it's kind of fitting that we're sitting down here in the gear store right now, like, because this is kind of a new addition, and you've done such an amazing job of growing this thing from its small beginnings into this, you know, world known mecca that it's become. So, well, I. I mean, let's get it straight. I haven't done anything like that. I mean, I was available <laughs> for you guys. Uh, so I, the way I lo- I've always looked at it is that, you know, I was here and you guys showed up and I kind of made you, uh, made a place for you guys to hang out. Yeah. But I have nothing to do with it besides providing a space. I think the guys that, Martin and uh, Porter and, uh, you know, all those guys that were, you know, had the vision of developing the yeah, climbing. Sure. You know, those are, I mean, I just provided a space and I'm, I'm I enjoyed it. I was good. It's yeah, good. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think you're being a little too humble in that respect because, <laughs> frankly, you know, this could have just been another backwoods, yeah. middle of nowhere climbing area. But you've provided this spot for yeah. all these people to congregate and have a base. And, you know, everywhere I go, climbing there there are miguel's t-shirts and miguel's right. stickers and everybody's been here and knows this place so let's go let's like rewind well, all let, the way back me, yeah yeah but, do it talking about that is like <clears throat> when i was hanging out at the pizza shop and uh daria was in diapers behind the gallery, yeah, you know yeah <laughs> and martin showed up you know and they started hanging out martin hackleworth I yeah don't know if you remember yeah, him talking. totally and he would show up with some of his friends with their tights and, yeah. and have ice cream. And they would come, you know, a few times uh, after a few weekends. He uh, approached me and said, listen, we, we really like the, the spirit of this place. And we, would you want to open up, you know, we could uh, teach you how to rock climb and you could sell the gear for us. Yeah. But that's what really started that. It's like the, they saw the spirit of the place. That's what anything um, uh, is successful. It's about the spirit of the place. Totally, totally. So th- that's what started it. Yep. And uh, but Martin had um, 
the awareness of that. Yeah, he helped so you see how to integrate it. So I give him some credit, it. you know, because yeah. he had the spirit of saying, yeah, this place is cool. Let's, they're cool people. Let's do something here, you know. Yeah. Because I didn't even know what climbing was before then. I mean, I was totally naive of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's, you're right. That's super important. And I think that spirit kind of started way back in the beginning because you were an artist early right. on. Like you came over, you came to the U.S. from Portugal in when you were six, is that seven, right? Yeah. Six or seven. What yeah. year was that? Yeah, that was in 1959. Okay. And then how early did you pick up art? Oh, I, I think it was that uh, I didn't speak any English, so the teachers just gave me some crayons. Oh, yeah. And put me in the back of the class. <laughs> he doesn't know how to speak a word, so we just put me back there, and I started doodling. And then, um, uh, you know, they would give me, like, uh, assignments like to decorate the wall or something yeah and uh, i started out with that and just something that uh, art just gave me an escape mm -hmm. because coming from a village where you had nobody there uh, i mean we didn't have anything i mean basically um so it just gave me um i don't know just like a direction and, and sure uh, and coming to the united states where i didn't know anything um, um, living in an environment that um, was kind of uh, terrifying because here we have a village that you, you're, it's healthy looking. There's, you're out in the woods and you come to a concrete jungle. Yeah. And so uh, art was an escape from that. From yeah. There. And you were Always in Connecticut? Is that right? Connecticut. We, we yeah. ended up in a, in a ghetto there that was yeah. pretty intense. <laughs> Grew yep. up with that until I was uh, 16 and was able to... Uh, have a vehicle to get out of there. Yeah, and from there, did you go to California? Is that uh, right? Not right away. I went to Rhode Island, traveled around. Okay. And you were going to go to the Rhode Island Institute of it's, Art. And yeah, you but decided didn't have, you couldn't, couldn't afford, afford it. it. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it was the Rhode Island School of Design. Okay. I got accepted at that. But um, yeah. And so, then when you moved out to California, what what was out there? Why did you go? Well, there? I was just doing artwork, trying yeah. to uh, be trying a to live maker. the artist life. Living the the bohemian artistic life. Yeah, <laughs> what's I mean, you you fell right back into that bohemian lifestyle here, which is pretty well, interesting. I, I I think the climbers all have that in them. Yeah, they're in a way they're artists themselves. But yeah, um, totally. And bohemian on top of that. But um, yeah, um, what brought you here to Kentucky? Well, Kentucky was like um, I had I was in Rhode Island and I met. Neville Pohl. Okay. Know, I met him, and uh, we got, uh, we were asked to take some artwork out west in a big semi truck. Yeah. And that we were paid to do this. And sure. so we made a big trip out of it. Yeah. Went across the country up northern uh, California and came down to San Diego. But, uh, and that, my life then started out there in the art world. That's where I really focused on it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, art's always been part of my um, uh, escape, kind of like climbers do uh, climbing to escape some of their things or whatever. But it's, it's a focus. You focus and you let your emotions out, whatever you have, yeah. put it on paper yeah. or whatever. I, I did etching, so that was my... Thing. Yeah, I've seen some. I saw one of your prints at Dario's house. Yeah, I'm gonna have was, to have a Miguel in my house someday. Someday so. we we can do that. Yeah, <laughs> you should totally start making them again and selling them to. I to still climbers. have the plates in my crawl space of my house. They're stashed in a box down there. Yeah, you yeah, should cool. do it. You would be in high demand in this yeah, really? community. <laughs> you know, I, art to me is always uh, uh, so. I play that role of being an artist and uh, and loved it. You know. But like we were talking earlier, you know, art becomes like part of your ego and you people, you go to a party and say, so what do you do? Well, I'm an artist. Yeah, yeah. And that got to me once. And uh, for, in, internally, I, I felt uncomfortable with that. So one day, for some reason, I was doodling. And this doodle came out with this image that I said, wow. It just inspired me. I said, I'm everything. I'm just, just not an artist. And that, that's when I gave up doing art and moved away from California and came back east. 
And it was basically was the drawing of this little care cartoon character lifting up like a, a costume of an artist, and he's going in it. So he's oh yeah. Good, um, can you imagine that totally image? Yep. So he's putting on that costume of an artist, right? And realizing that. You don't need a costume to be a person. Right. You just need just right. need to it be yourself. It was there all along. <laughs> yeah, didn't so need to you, have the outfit. Yeah, so I threw that outfit out and I became who I am today. <laughs> a pizza man. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're a lot more than a pizza man. I, but I mean, know. it was inspiring to that you could do anything. Yeah. You could be anything. And so um, that little drawing, I still have it. I kept it. And that was the most inspiring drawing I've ever had yeah. out of all the artwork I've ever done. Well, I think, you, <laughs> I think this... you've carried that on. I mean, when you came here and bought this place, it was just a little, a little shack, basically. Yeah, it was, really. Yeah. You know, when I first started climbing here 22 years ago, I remember it being just a little shack with, you yeah, know, and literally. almost no people here. Yeah, there was nobody here. It was, you know? But again, you, you just, uh, it's like any other piece of work, you start... And you stick with it. You yeah, know, and just like, just like your art teacher gave you crayons because you didn't right. know the language and you guys couldn't communicate, you didn't necessarily know the climber language no. back then. No, So you just had these crayons and you're like, let's, let's paint a picture. Let's build this thing and learn how to talk to these people through that. Yeah, that's you know? a good way to look at it. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's super, super cool. Let's talk about, just so you know, the people who are around get to know what the history is here let's let's look at once you bought this place it was called the jot em down jot store em down is that store. right yeah. yeah from um uh, some guy from cincinnati had started that down here yeah but yeah we it was an abandoned building uh we just cleaned it up and started selling ice cream I mean, yeah that was the beginning of that um because we didn't have any way of making money and i said i was driving all the way to winchester for uh, work at a horse farm. Right. I was raising vegetables for these uh, nice people, really. Yeah. And um, but so we were stuck out here, and we had to create something. Yeah. And did it already have a pizza oven? Was that? No, there was nothing there. It was a gift shop okay. originally. And so um, we just uh, started. Susan said, "Let's start with ice cream." And then um, after the ice cream went, the climbers started hanging out eating ice cream. Those the the team from Cincinnati. Yeah. All those. Yep. Yep. Guys, all the old tradies, all the old tradies, yeah. Keith Phelps and Tom Souders and Tom Souders, yeah. yeah. Awesome people, I yeah. mean, they were genuine, Great guys. awesome people. It's hard to find people like that, but um, yeah, and uh, they they wanted something to eat, and that's how we then said, okay, well, let's just pizza is good, <laughs> yeah. And I've had a like a little background in um, dealing with pizza dough and. Not so much pizza, though, but just bread making. Bread, our, yeah. In our village, we ground all the flour for all the village. So, we, Your family did. Our family did. So my grandparents were involved, and uh, we had like a, a grits mill that, we, that my grandfather had built. Oh, cool. So um, we ground all the flour for the whole community. And would the community come there? Come there, and then we would uh, negotiate, like, you know, you give us so much flour for grinding the rest, you know. And then we yeah. would also, you know, uh, bake bread, and then you could take it. My grandparents would take it to the city and sell it, and uh, they sold whatever, you know, cheese. They produced their own cheese and sold that. Wow. So I was around that as a baby, as a child. Yeah. And so. you're kind of repeating that now on a larger scale. You know, this is the community place. Yeah, this guess, is where yeah. everybody comes. Yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. You know, I only grew up around it for seven years, but it was uh, a, an interesting. Uh, it stayed with me. You know, it's yeah. down deep somewhere, <laughs> probably. Yeah, and then when did you? Is for it seems to me that for a long time it was still just that one little room. Yeah. Um, you mean for the like the pizza place? The pizza place, yeah, that little tiny space that we you know, and held up a pizza oven that cooked three with a piece a stick. Yeah, <laughs> we stuck it out the, the window. Yeah, yep, totally. <laughs> that, that was uh, that was crazy. What we got away with back here then with an odd house, not a bathroom. Yep, yep. It was, crazy. and there was you know there there weren't all these buildings that are here now, the pavilions yep. and the shelters and. 
You know, if I were, the parking lot was really small. Yeah, yeah, and then they uh, and the love shack was back there. Yeah, the old love shack. Yeah, yeah Porter. Uh, yeah, all those guys. Uh, you know, we we lived in it for a year and a half or so while we we're building our cabin, and then all the climbers took it over. Yeah. Until they got so dangerous because they were using the <laughs> building for firewood <laughs> to keep themselves warm in there. And what I, it just got like so dangerous because there was nothing structurally holding it up. Yeah. It was kind of terrifying. Porter so was I just said, burning his own house down to stay warm. <laughs> <laughs> so we, well, the Canadians were the, the ones that were doing that more because okay. all the Canadians came down after Porter put yep. up because uh, they knew Porter. Yep. So he invited them all. There were 30 of them out here at one time, you know, living in their vans. And then they started taking that thing apart. And one day I went in there and I saw just one wall just had little boards. I said, this thing's going to fall on you guys. <laughs> so I put a big piece of plywood on the door and kept them out, but they still crawled in through the windows. Yeah, for sure. And then that winter I said, I'm going to, you know, I burned the, you know, we uh, had the fire department up. and uh, Yeah, I think it was falling apart by the time that, that I was here. He's showing up. Like it yeah. was on Ed, its, you know, Ed Mack its... was living upstairs too. I don't yep. know. If you, um, yep. Yeah. With Porter. Ed's still around. He's still here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's he's uh, quite a character. Yeah. So when Porter came, it kind of started to explode shortly after. Like nothing like it is now, but no, 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 still no. Yeah. pretty big. Well, he wrote that first. Um, the first little guide. Well, no, before he that, he wrote well, the, that article, article. Rock and Ice, yep. The Jaws of the Red or something. I remember that. Shark. Yep. Yep. It's pretty cool, a shark. And um, Twinkie was like uh, uh, the big one back then. Yeah. It was like the, what is it, 12-something? 12 12A, 12 yeah. That was like, everybody had to come from there. And it's like, yeah. Yeah, no place else in the world really has that kind of climbing. Oh, you really? Know? It's pretty unique to hear. When did you start adding on? Like, well, after Porter showed up, I mean, it's like uh, within you know two years, it just started. People were showing up from Europe, and yep. uh, so it was. It, it got built up. So we started building more shelters, and yep. uh, you built the kitchen, the kitchen out, right? Yeah, yeah. Built the kit in addition to the kitchen, and um, I think one of the crazy things people don't realize is that the basement, you know. Beneath it was, it was a crawl space. Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah, we kept our stored, trash down there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I remember. And Porter dug it out, right? No, it was me, Roger, and um, Kenton. Oh, me, really? Roger and Kenton. Kenton yeah. One winter, we got down there. And it was all sand. It's uh, it, we dug all that by hand. Wow. It was. We went down four feet, four feet of sand. It was amazing. We dug it all out one winter, and then. Poor, we asked Porter to come in and show us how to sh uh, protect that, you know, the structure. Make it structural, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the foundation, how to protect. And he came in while he was going by climbing. He would stop in for an hour and advice, give us advice on it. And uh, yep. that was pretty good. Yeah, well, I think one of the hallmarks, in my opinion, of, you know, a, a good artist is that they're able to kind of ride on the front of – whatever waves are happening you know yeah. and they kind of create the you know for lack of a better word the the image of what this new wave looks like you know i think that's what artists do a lot of the times and i think you were able to even though you want to be humble about it and give and and martin deserves credit for sure yeah yeah and so do so does porter so Everything. does everyone who built it but oh God, yeah. but you were able to ride on the front of that wave and keep expanding for this community that was just exploding year after year after year. And you're still doing it. Every time I, every yeah. season I come back yeah. here, there's something new yep. and you've expanded to fill the needs that are about to happen. Exactly. You know, I think that's super important and it feels creative. It feels, you know, you were on the front end of the first time I ever saw pizza that had more than just pepperoni, sausage, <laughs> onions, and mushrooms was, really? was here. Okay. Well, that, that was all inspired by climbers themselves. I, don't give me any credit. Like corn on the pizza was – that was uh, a creek. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was Sam. Sam Creek said, we got to have some corn on this pizza. Okay, sure. Let's put it on there. Yeah. and I, I think, personally don't like it, but corn on the sure, pizza. <laughs> sure. But, so – 
Did you ever get into climbing yourself? I know you... A little bit with Martin and yeah. uh, Keith. They would take me out. I did like roadside, uh, you know, all those little sevens and eights, you know. Yeah. Arachnid was... I, th- I thought that was my favorite. That was fun. Yeah. But uh, I I never really took it up as uh, as, you know, didn't really inspire me that much climbing yeah. i really enjoyed the art part more side of things yeah and they gave me the same thrill uh but it's i was fun i mean i enjoyed that time of it that i did a, a little bit of it and then moved on you know it's like uh, like yeah. anything else i've done with my life yeah and you're, you're, enjoy the you're so connected to the community here what's what's this community give back to you if it's not climbing that you're super interested in well i i i just you know, climbers, in general, the majority of them, they're not the typical everyday, you know, uh, even though they all go to college and they want to go to college and then graduate and have a job, but the, the ones that are got into climbing, they're, they have something more, a little spark beyond that. Mm-hmm. And they're looking for some adventure in their lives. And uh, I've always felt that way about my life. So, you know, I'm not cookie cut thing you know yeah i like to explore and uh and i think climbers have that in them and that's what i think i enjoy about climbers yeah is that adventure to be able to uh you know create something out of nothing sometimes yeah totally you know you you have to have that to survive in this world if you don't have that then you're you're doomed (laughs) yeah yeah and you know i think I think this space that you've created here, like I started climbing here when I was 19 or so. And, and it seems like when I think back, like a lot of my formative moments happened down here. And the time that I spent, you know, reliving those moments and analyzing those moments, a lot of it happened sitting in your dining room or yeah. sleeping in your parking lot or, or whatever. You know, so this place feels like I grew up here, you know, and I think a lot of people go through that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's what we provide here. It gives you an opportunity to uh, take time out and to look at your life. I mean, because I did the same thing when I was in California traveling. I, you know, I, I traveled a, a lot out there, and I had a lot of moments. I would go out to the desert by myself and camp out yeah. and look at it, look at everything a, a, a different without any influence around you just by yourself and that's really good to have and this place kind of gives you that you know like the kids can come here young people and work for us and uh, take time out and save a little cash to go on a trip and that mm-hmm. gives them a year to go and explore that like I did I mean I yeah. did that you know even though I didn't go to school after but it's you know it's good to take it a little break Look at it and uh, go back into it because you got to go back into it. There's no way you can escape it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's gonna no happen. Matter how eventually. you try, <laughs> yeah, you got to go back into it. Yeah, you gotta for be sure. Part of it, otherwise you won't be fulfilled if you're not part of it. Yep. And you get to see those kids come back year after year. Like a lot of them stay here for several years. Yeah. You know, and work their summers, even though summer might be the worst season to climb here. They're like this place is home that's this is where i go for the summer yeah it's true yeah yeah every year there's uh more and more and yeah this is their little home for a short time not yeah. permanently <laughs> yeah and that's probably a good thing for your sanity <laughs> yeah yeah not that, permanently. that you're not raising thousands of teenagers no i don't want to <laughs> yeah. yeah but but you know what you've done a great job with the kids you do have you yeah. know Dario's amazing. Sarah's amazing. I don't know Mark nearly as well, but he seems like a cool kid every time I'm he's around him. You know, in my mind, Mark's still five. Yeah. So it's hard to see him now and be like, oh my God, I'm, how old am I? Yeah, he just became 21. Yeah, and you're a grandpa. Yeah. You got, you got Three some children. cool Three grandchildren. grandkids. Yeah. It's yeah, awesome. how's that? It's good. I mean, it, um, I enjoy their space, you know, their time with them, and um, and I think the reason that is what's inspiring me to do art again. You know, you could uh, you could uh, leave and 
you know, you, money and stuff, and they could burn that up in no time. But if you leave them some artwork, that's why I want to get back into it. Yeah. To leave them some kind of art they can put up in the wall when they can remember you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After yeah. you're gone, whereas anything else that's just gone. Yeah. Well, you've got this legacy too, you yeah. know, that you've really, really fostered and built down here. And I, re- I remember reading in an article years ago that you said, that you were talking about how your kids were all into rock climbing and you said, my son's a little too much into it. I wish he would run the business more. You know, how's, how's he doing now? He's doing really good. Yeah. He, he's really, <laughs> he's, he's, he's back here listening. There. So yeah, there is, there is, he's, he stepped up to the plate. He's, he's knows what he's doing. He know he's very creative like me. Yeah. And, uh, he, yeah, I think it just takes time, you know, a little bit of, um, I think it also my wife needs to give him more freedom to do it more. Yeah. <laughs> poor Susie. Yeah. <laughs> she's not totally comfortable she's yet. She's not comfortable letting go of the letting reins. Go. Yeah, the reins. That's so. tough to do. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's hard. How are you handling it? Awesome. You're just ready, ready to hand them over. Yeah. You're like, Dario, take this thing. I don't yeah. want it. I think so. I think so. I'm ready. Well, I think you're in a good spot. You know, you get to see all these kids you've essentially raised. You know, they've, they've all grown up under your roofs <laughs> and you know and now you've got grandkids you need to enjoy and yeah the i think that's things a that, good uh, idea to hand it off yeah it's, it's yeah it's at a point that it's grown enough and it's kind of maintaining itself pretty well yeah so it's really good you know you know the the whole thing too is that there dario's always been and mark uh we raised them in a with a spirit of um you know, that we're all, you know, we have like some merit, you know, and uh, all people have merit and to yeah. treat everybody with that, you know, with a certain, um, uh, what's the word, uh, respect or something, you know, that yeah. we all need to respect one another and stuff. And that's the way, you know, it should be. I've raised them that way, and I think they do that. Yeah, I know. think they do as well. Yeah, and you know, it's it's been pretty cool to watch Dario. So when I first started climbing here, he was he was pretty young. Yeah, I remember. and it's it's really fun to watch him become such a part of this community and a pillar in this community. Really, I mean, everybody knows who he is. He's a stand up guy in every situation, and everybody respects him. You know, oh, cool. I'm I don't think yeah, I'll like ever that. hear a bad word about. <laughs> Dario, you know, because I think he's just a super good guy and everybody realizes that. And uh, that's, you know, that's in no small part because of you, you know, that's right. What There's you've a, done here and built building this community was huge for him as a kid. Yeah. Yeah. You have to. But one thing I've learned about all that, too, there, you know, in life, there are two types of people. There are givers and there are takers. And you have to know who you want to hang out with, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, no <laughs> you, doubt. You really, that's yeah. so important because uh, yeah. you could run yourself down. So it's, it's got to be a balance. Yeah. And I'm trying to teach that into them. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's uh, really great. That's, the, that's a, one thing that has to be learned. <laughs> yeah, good. Well, before life. <laughs> before we wrap this up, do you? What's your like craziest standout Miguel's story? What story. Do, What do you remember happening around here that God. was the <laughs> craziest thing you remember? I don't. Oh, I, there's there've been a, probably a lot, but other uh, than the Spencer Victory fireballs. <laughs> you know, but. Well, I think I think one one. Uh, what was it for Thanksgiving or was it uh, maybe it was Halloween, our first Halloween, I think. I don't know if you heard this story. There was uh, two drag queens showed up. No. <laughs> <laughs> dressed in really hot clothes and yeah. I don't really thought they were women. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were underneath, you remember the old basketball court? Yeah. They, they were under there and uh, they... Uh, uh, they were like they wanted a party or something. So somebody told me about. There's two ladies here. They want a party. And I said, well, <laughs> "What kind of party they're into?" So I go over it and and I said, "What's going on here? You know, what kind of party you're looking for?" And they said, "Oh, we just want a party." And it says, 
we know Miguel really well, and uh, he said we can hang out here and party and stuff. And I said, oh, that's cool. You know Miguel. <laughs> <laughs> and I could just let it go, you know, and I just said, well, this place here, these climbers, you know, they're, they're not much into partying right now. They, they, you know, they climb all day, they're tired, they're burnt out. Yeah. And they just go to bed. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so, and they just moved on. It was really funny. That was uh, interesting that's day. hilarious well you know there are rumors that you don't actually exist oh really because, that's good because you're not around during the day that's i know good. well let's let's do it keep it up i've heard way. it i've heard the rumors that miguel's isn't actually a real person that, yeah that's that's true yeah that's true i made that <laughs> drawing up with the, i don't have any hair any anymore any blonde hair anymore <laughs> Awesome, man. Well, I, I I appreciate you sitting down with me a ton, cool. and congrats on another successful season here. Well, I've, I've always here. enjoyed you, Chris. Thank you for yeah. Well, I'll be back. This. I've always enjoyed hanging out with you, and uh, you've always been a motivation to me, especially with your artwork too. So. Oh, thanks, okay. man. All right, stay tuned because we'll be coming right back with Dario talking about his experiences uh, growing up at Miguel's. All right. Break. Break. If you're listening to this episode while planning a trip to the Red, then we have got you covered with our Red River Trip Prep training plan. I climbed my first everything up to 514 in the Red, as did Drew Mack, so I enlisted his help in figuring out how best to help folks prepare for the pump. These plans are delivered through our mobile app with videos for each exercise, many of which have been developed specifically for the demands of the Red. You'll get weekly progressions, a flexible schedule that can fit nearly any lifestyle, and a resource library with tips for making the most of your trip to the area, including several recommended route lists from both Drew and I. And these are seven-week programs, so consider getting started about eight weeks out from your trip. Go to powercompanyclimbing.com slash trip dash prep to learn more or to sign up, or you can find the link right there in your show notes. Man, so so I just want to get your perspective. Like, as you know, when I first started climbing here, what well, I was that was twenty two years ago. How old are you now? I'm about to be thirty three. So you were like an eleven year old yeah. at the time. I had a sick bowl cut. <laughs> you did have a sick bowl cut. That's awesome. What was this place like for you as an eleven year old, or as a you know even younger? Because Porter and Snide and all those guys were around before before i got here uh i guess it was like i was also i was homeschooled so i was here a lot and uh so i spent a lot of time just hanging around them on rest days for them uh so i guess for me it was just like having a playground of extremely old friends <laughs> <laughs> extremely old and nutty friends. yeah and crazy uh which i think in turn made me feel pretty comfortable around most people because they, they, you know, they're an odd crew, you know. Yeah, I think, you know, if you're homeschooled and, you know, especially in a community like this where it's backwoods Kentucky, basically, <laughs> that that could lead to not being very social, not understanding how to move through a community. Mm -hmm. But but those guys kind of took you under their wings, if I remember right. Oh, like, yeah. When I first started coming down here, you were like the cool, popular kid. <laughs> Everybody was psyched when you were around you yeah know? so having all those friends from all these different places all the time you know i think you've i just told your dad i think you've become this really important part of the the worldwide climbing community really everybody knows you and everybody respects you and i think that's you know in yeah. partially due to that that upbringing here yeah i mean i guess i yeah i don't, I don't know <laughs> i just I feel very fortunate uh, because like you said, like even when I went to regular school and like kind of got out of my climbing bubble, yeah. Uh, then I got to feel the side of like, uh, no one knows you. <laughs> How right, I was right. not the cool kid. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. But no, I feel fortunate because I think that uh, I was very cultured for living in a very uncultured area. Yeah. Uh, and that's, I mean, I, I guess that's contributed to, you know, what my dad started in this whole thing, but it's lucky. Yeah. <laughs> lucky is the best way to put it, I guess. 
Yeah, and I've watched you gradually kind of start to take the reins of the business yeah. and, you know, continue this thing that your dad's been doing. Yeah. And, and I admire that he's, and I have admired this for years, that he and you and everybody here kind of grows it with the community. Like, yeah. you guys seem like you're right on the front edge of knowing what the community needs yeah. and and then providing that before we even know we need it. Right. And I think it's cool that you're taking that over and you know and continuing to grow it yeah i mean i think if you have one if i think it's easier for us maybe and i don't know if we notice it on purpose because we're just so in in deep in like the climbing community and dealing with the people every day that like the needs are not necessarily like you know i always talk to people and they're like so how did you plan this out or how did you, you know, how did this come about? And I don't think many of our plans come about that way. It's more like it becomes a necessity and then we're like, well, this is what needs to be done next, which is kind of like a never ending spiral tunnel because there's always something next. Yeah, sure. But, <clears throat> and this place just keeps exploding. Exploding. Yeah. So, but I mean, now it's come to a point where it's like, um, uh, you know, now we're just kind of like, whoa, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this place is crazy. But who knows? I mean, I think my dad's a, always is, assumes sometimes that that maybe it's the need is not there, but we'll still provide it. But then every time we assume that, the need is filled. So it's kind of like we're always kind of like surprised, and people are like, "Why are you surprised?" <laughs> we're like, "I don't know. Maybe we're too humble, or I don't know what the deal is." I but. think you are. I think both you and your dad are like humble almost to a fault. Like, yeah, sometimes I think we should. Like be you more. both want to give credit elsewhere <laughs> and not take credit. And man, I think what you guys do here is a super special, super important thing. I mean, Miguel's, and I know you've heard this term that it's been called the Camp Four of the East. Right. And I've spent a little bit of time in Camp Four and Camp Four at, sucks. At this point I would argue that <laughs> Camp Four isn't even quite the Miguel's of the West. <laughs> yeah. Like Camp Four This I, place is way cooler. I know I grew up always hearing about Camp Four from climbers and being like, Yeah, this place is and then when I finally went to Camp Four and I was like sneaking in Russ Clune to sleep in a tent with me <laughs> so he wouldn't get kicked out. I was like, This is not <laughs> Miguel's is not the camp for the cell. Yeah, it's just, you know, the history is out there. And yeah. those guys, you know, romanticized that history and wrote about it. Yeah. And so it's become this larger than life thing. But Miguel's really is a, a life size large thing. Like it's, it's real. It's here. It doesn't need the romanticizing because it's true. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I just think maybe why it's come to that. It, I, I mean, I know my dad doesn't like to take credit for it, but I think that they believed in, I guess you could call it the outdoor industry, maybe not just the outdoor industry in general, way before it actually really existed. Yeah. And by believing it, like, it just gives you a step up because you're like, you're the person that's trying, you know, you're, you just have a step up on everyone, not because you planned it or did some diagram like most right, business people right. would do. Yeah. You just like are there and you believe and you stick it out long enough that eventually it pays off. Yeah, that's huge. And I, you know, people come to us a lot and they're like, so, you know, what's the secret? And it's like, honestly, you just have to like lose money for like 20 years <laughs> <laughs> and live really poor. And then eventually it'll, then you eventually it pays off. Yeah, just keep believing in yourself even when it's tough. Yeah. You know, even when there are like 12 dirty climbers are your only customers. Yeah, exactly. And the wait is like two hours for a pizza and you're just like, but no one cared, you know, it was just, yeah, because, uh, yeah. I know people don't realize like when we were kids, how poor we really were, yeah. you know? Yeah. But, was there a point as like a young adult when you were like, there's no way I'm taking this business over? Yeah. Uh, I mean, when I went to, when I left to go to college, I had no desire to do yeah. it. Uh, I want, I wanted to go to school and actually I wanted to go into business, but I wanted to like, I don't know. I, I think at that time I didn't even think of Miguel's as a business, right? you know, cause it, it had not really blossomed into what it is now. So, and then I went to business school and then I started learning what they were teaching in business school. And it was like this 
cutthroat, like how to put your neighbor out of business attitude. And I was yeah. like, and I grew up in an area where we were literally the only business and that we never had to deal with that, you know, it was just, mm-hmm. just like everyone was just kind of easygoing and, and I was really turned off by it. And then it almost drew me back to this business because I was like, that's the side of the business I like, like this family kind of like oriented, like low cutthroat attitude, you know, it's just like, yeah, it turned me off. <laughs> yeah. And you've now, you know, you've got Cedar, your daughter, you're married and Emily's amazing. And, you know, your family is here. Like yeah. you guys, yeah. you moved down here to the same area yeah. and are continuing this business. And, you know, so you must, you must have turned that corner and feel really good about this place now. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's definitely, I wouldn't go anywhere else. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, and it's awesome. My my wife, she loves climbing, and and it just it's perfect for us. And yeah, there was a while there where I wondered if you would continue climbing. Yeah, like I, I was curious about how how you saw it being pretty much the only true local down here. Yeah, you know, and no other locals here climb. Right. You know, I thought oh, I wonder if Dario will keep climbing, but it seems like it's just gotten stronger over the years. Like, yeah, I think I think that. I've just, I've, uh, I think it, when, like any kid, if you grow up in something, with something, and, you know, I grew up around everyone being like, yeah, you need to be a rock climber, you need to, like, go crush, like, you kind of get overwhelmed by it, yeah. uh, and then, uh, now that I've, I'm back here, and I'm climbing a lot again, now it's, it's, it really is, like, a, an enjoyment for me, and a freedom that I look forward to every day, and, I mean, I don't know if I'd want to live in Slate, Kentucky if I wasn't a rock climber. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, I, I can see that at the crag. Like, yeah. You're definitely enjoying it. Yeah. Emily's enjoying it. And Cedar's just the coolest kid to have around She's at awesome. the crag. You yeah. know, she comes up with the best names for people, which <laughs> I thought I was good at. She's way better. So. But yeah, yeah man, I'm, I'm super stoked that you're taking this over and continuing this thing and that you're such an important part of this community because i've you know i've decided that my life is needs to be lived inside this community and yeah. you know i'm i'm stoked to be able to be a part of it with you yeah me too man yeah it's uh hopefully continues that's yeah. that's my hope i hope this place just stays good like it is right now for so i die at least <laughs> yeah i don't i don't think it's gonna go any other way man yeah. so you guys have done something special here so Thanks for taking a few minutes. I know Cedar's up with Grandma and Grandpa now. I got some freedom. (laughs) (laughs) I'll, I'll let you have that. All right. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, thanks, man. Like we said, they are constantly adapting and evolving over there. But it warms my cold little heart that some things may never change. Miguel will still be there making the dough in the mornings. There will be Ventura kids running around. And it has and will always remain an important icon in the climbing world. Dario is now running a different family restaurant, uh, Red Point Barbecue, just down the road. Mark is now doing a lot of the day-to-day at Miguel's. Basically, if you're going to the Red, they are inescapable exactly as it should be to everybody over there congrats on 40 years i recognize exactly how lucky i was to be there in the 90s and 2000s to see it grow the way that it did and i really hope to see you all again soon You all can find us at powercompanyclimbing.com where we have thousands of articles, training plans, courses, and products built specifically to help climbers just like you learn, grow, and excel.
Jesus.